everyone, I'm Joelle. Welcome to Riverway Church. We're so glad to have you joining us here online. This summer, we are pausing our live stream Sunday services until September. Thank you for your patience as we navigate this change. We invite you to join us in person on Sundays at 10 a.m. for our services at Champlain Park High School. To stay current with all of our recent messages, just visit our website or our Riverway Church YouTube channel. And to stay updated all summer long with everything happening at Riverway, the best way to connect is through the Riverway app. This app is personalized with events, messaging, and faith steps just for you. Simply search the Riverway Church app in your app store to get started. Before we share our latest talk, here are a few things coming up around Riverway for you and your family. Our next fifth Sunday service project is coming up on July 30th. On fifth Sundays, we cancel our services and work together to make a difference in our community. It's about doing more than just attending church and actively being the church together. Immediately following our service projects, you'll be heading over to River Park in Brooklyn Park for our annual church picnic from 11.30 to 2 p.m. We will be providing all the food and beverages and the cost will be $5 a person or $20 a family. We will also have some yard games, but feel free to bring your own. Another way to be a part of our upcoming fifth Sunday is through your giving. This enables us to buy supplies and materials needed to make a difference in our community. Jesus modeled the importance of leading with blessing and your giving enables us to put this into practice. You can give today on our app or by texting GIVE to the number up on your screen. Before Jeremiah kicks off our new series, Red Letters, please pull up your message notes on our app as they are a great way to follow along with the message. Today we're kicking off this series called Red Letters. And we're gonna be taking just a deeper look at some of the words that Jesus said. This is noted in many Bibles in red letters and red type. We're gonna discuss the significance of Jesus' teachings and what they mean for us today. I once heard a pastor say something, this is our very first fill-in here, is that the source of the words determines the weight of the words. All right, the source of the words determine the weight of the words. For example, I don't always listen and take everything my kids tell me for 100% face value, right? Not that my kids are ever wrong, but sometimes they tell me some questionable things. You know, and I'm like, where did you hear that? And usually it's YouTube, okay? So I always got to consider the source when I'm hearing information or knowing where it's coming from. But when we look at Jesus here, okay, the Son of God, the person who predicted his own death and resurrection and actually pulled it off, when we look at his words, they carry the utmost weight. You see, we're looking at words that have the power to heal, to restore, to uplift, to transform, to empower, to equip, to strengthen, to enlighten, to encourage, to unite, and on and on and on. And you may have heard us say this around here before as well, but we believe this, and it's your next villain, that following the words and teaching of Jesus makes our lives better, and it makes us better at life. Right? Following the words and teachings of Jesus makes our lives better, but it also makes us better at life. So throughout this series, it's our hope and our prayer that by the time we get to the end of this, at the end of the summer, that you could say that these teachings of Jesus have truly impacted your life and have made you better at life and made your life better. So I want us to begin, but I just want to ask a question, all right? Pretty simple. I'm going to ask a question this morning. The question is simple is, what if Jesus was right? What if Jesus was right? Now you're probably thinking, right about what, right? <laughs> Where's Jared going with this? Right about what? But here's the thing. Jesus, yes, he's the son of God. So it's easy for us to say, oh, whatever he says, you know, that's spiritually the right direction we're supposed to go. But what if we boil this down even a little more practically and ask the question, what if Jesus actually knew what he was talking about? Not just from a spiritual standpoint of, yes, we should follow him, but just what if he was absolutely right about what he was talking about? You see, we tend to forget that Jesus was actually the most intelligent teacher to ever live. And his teachings aren't just right from a spiritual sense, but they are good, right? That's what morality is, the good and true way to live. And that's the way Jesus taught. Your next film here is that Jesus' teachings are statements about how the world actually works. All right, his teachings are just the truth about how the world actually works. And if we ignore them, not only do we rupture our relationship with God, but we go against the grain of the universe that he created. Right? So it's a double whammy. Not only does it rupture our relationship, 
but it's going to make life a whole lot more harder for us. And many of Jesus' teachings are actually found in this famous Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew's Gospel accounts in chapters 5 through 7. And in fact, this is one of the most widely quoted sections in all the Gospels. So this morning, we're just going to look at this passage, some of Jesus' own words that are recorded in Matthew 6, 19 through 24. I'm just going to read this whole passage to start, and then we're going to break it down into a few sections, okay? So bear with me as we read this section together. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 22, we continue, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, before I go any further, no, this message is not about giving, okay? So huge sigh of relief. It's not about giving, but it's actually about something much deeper, Okay? It's about something much deeper. I mean, if I were to ask all of you here if you serve God or if you serve money, I'm sure most of you would say, yeah, I serve God, right? I don't serve money. But if I were to ask you, are your lifestyle and spending habits allowing you to build God's kingdom, to be generous where God leads you, and to live a life of peace and joy? How would you answer that question? Because I think if we were all really, really honest, myself included, answering yes to that second question is much more difficult than answering yes to the first question, do I serve God or money? Because none of us would want to think that we serve money, serve things. But when we truly look at it, are my spending habits, is my lifestyle truly building God's kingdom, allowing me to be generous, and just bringing more peace and joy to my life? That's a difficult question for us to really consider how we would answer that. So that really brings us back to this first question. Am I serving God or money? You see, Jesus wasn't just teaching spiritual ideas. He was teaching what's true. And whether we believe him or not is another matter. But either way, this idea about money and stuff really corresponds with the way we live our lives and our reality today. So let's look at those first few verses Again, here, Matthew 6, 19 through 24, where he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, to lay up treasures here on earth is really to doom ourselves to a life of frustration and emptiness. Right? Because there's never a complete satisfaction with what we have here on earth. In your next film, regarding material things, the secret to happiness is not more. It's contentment. It's not more. It's contentment. There is a landmark study out of Princeton University where these two great minds collaborated on a nationwide research project. Uh, Dr. Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winning psychologist, and Dr. Angus Deaton, a well-respected economist. They spent several months poring over data from over 450,000 Gallup survey results, and they concluded this, that your overall well-being does rise with your income, but only to a point. After that, you either plateau, or worse, often, it declines. Here's Dr. Dean in his own words. He says, no matter where you live, your emotional well-being is as good as it's going to get at $75,000. And money's not going to make it any better beyond that point. It's like you hit some sort of ceiling, and you can't get emotional well-being much higher just by having more money. Now, somebody looked at this data and concluded that, you know, depending on what city you live in, living costs could be, you know, factoring into that number. But however, they say at the end of the day, the study still indicates that $75,000 is the limit even in large, expensive cities. So what this research study shows us is that 
you know, for most of us that classify as a middle-class family, money and more stuff won't deliver us any more happiness. It won't. More money your next fill-in and more stuff will not make you happier. It just won't. More money and more stuff will not make you happier. You see how upside down our culture's message about money and stuff really is? Another per, uh, observer of the study called our culture's view of things psychotic and that it has completely lost touch with reality. He wisely observed that we in the West are like guinea pigs in one huge economic experiment in consumption. And you know who saw all this coming? Jesus, right? That's why over 2,000 years ago, he warned us about this very thing. So we cannot serve both of these things. One leads to life and to joy and to true fulfillment, and the other one leaves us empty. So basically what he's saying is don't invest all your time and your energy and money in things that get old and rust and go out of style and can be snatched from the back of your car if you park in the wrong neighborhood. But instead, put your life into things that matter, right? Like a relationship with God and life in his kingdom. Because your next film here is where you put your resources is where you put your heart. Where you put your resources is where you put your heart. Really, it's the steering wheel to the engine of desire in our lives. And I don't just mean more money, or I don't just mean money when I say resources. I mean all the things that God has blessed you with, your talents, the giftings he's given you, but also your time. These are all of our resources, you know, money, our talents, our time. How are we actually spending those things? Because I tell you this, that the way we manage these things is a direct reflection of the condition of our hearts and reveals what's truly most important to us and really who we are serving. Jesus would continue in verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now if you're thinking, what do eyes have to do with money? I'm tracking with you too, okay? It can be a little confusing. Uh, but in Jesus' day... If people said you had a healthy eye, it really had this double meaning. Okay, it meant one, that you were focused on living with a high degree of intentionality in life, right? You were focused, but also it meant that you were generous to the poor, right? You were focused, but you're also generous to the poor. When you looked at the world, you saw those in need and did your best to help out, right? That's what it means to have a good eye. Now, an unhealthy eye, or as in some versions of the Bible, even call it an evil eye, it was the exact opposite. When you looked out on the world, you were distracted by all the glittery, shiny things, the newest, the biggest, the best, the brightest. You were distracted and drawn to those things. And you lost your focus on what really matters most. So in turn, you closed your fist to the poor. So this idea behind having a good eye is either about being generous or single-minded. But both the principles apply to our attitudes towards material things. Being single-minded brings light to our lives, where we're also happier and more content when we focus on God and all that he's doing in our lives. But when we are double-minded, it is as if your whole body is full of darkness. Full of darkness. Now, I know some of you might try to say, well, you know, I do good quite often. I, I'm generous on occasion. I, can, I try to kind of have a toe, have a foot kind of in both of these worlds, right? Where I want what I want, but I also, you know, I, I can be generous at times. But we can't serve both, right? Or this constant tug, this constant tug, or even a little bit of darkness can just ruin our whole lives. Who here likes going to the state fair? Anybody? Anybody state fair? Yeah, it's coming up real soon. Come up real soon. Uh, this heat and this uh, summer kind of reminds me a little bit of the state fair coming up. One of my favorite things at the fair is a huge glass of cold, fresh squeezed lemonade, right? Who just loves the lemonade at the state fair? State fair, yeah. I probably drink at least half a dozen of those every time I go. But here's the situation. I love lemonade, especially when I'm thirsty, hot like this. I could drink them all day. Now, if someone was like, here, here's a few, huge glass of lemonade. But the one caveat is that I dropped a tiny little droplet of poison in the lemonade. Do you think I would drink it? No. Even though it's, you know, probably 0.00001% of what's in there, the poison would affect everything that it touched. 
So it would be crazy for me to be like, yeah, I'll just still drink the poison. I would want that thing as far away from me as possible. And the same is true in the way we spend our money and spend our time and spend our lives chasing after things. Even if we think, oh, it's just this one purchase, or it's just this one thing, or it's just this one lifestyle choice I want to pursue. Is it best for me? I don't know, but it's just one thing. Here's the thing, it's never just that one thing. And Jesus knew this. This is a good teaching that he is giving to us. You see, we try to live for two masters at the same time, and it puts a dark shadow over everything in our lives. You see, one of the many reasons that our happiness is dropping, even as we continue to gather more and more stuff and buy that new car and buy that new uh, expensive toy, whatever it might be, is because materialism has sped up our society to this frantic, untenable pace where we just can't keep up. As Alan Faldling put it, the drive to possess is an energy, is, is an engine for hurry. The drive to possess is an engine for hurry. And I saw this quote, and it made me think when I was a kid, when we would go to visit my grandma, she had this little magnet on her fridge that just sticks out to me. And all it said was, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get. Terrible grammar, but I'm not sure. Has anybody heard this phrase before? Apparently it's very common. The hurrier I go, the behinder I get. And when I was a kid, it made no sense to me, right? How can I go faster? How can I hurry my way through life but get behind her on things? That's the way we get caught up, right? That's the way we become more efficient. Do we go faster? How do we... How do we get behind by hurrying? But I tell you what, as I've gotten older, and as I've kind of lived in what we call the rat race of life, it's all started to become crystal clear that this hurry truly does put us behind her in the things that truly matter most in our lives. You see, every single thing you buy costs not only money, but also time. And less time equals more hurry. You see, we've managed to get this whole dynamic backwards. Instead of spending money to get more time, we actually have opted for the reverse, where we spend time to get money. Here's this endless cycle this puts us on, okay? So it takes time to get money, money to go get stuff, and stuff takes money and time to use and upkeep to enjoy, which then makes us need more time to get more money for more stuff, which leads to more money and more time and more stuff. And it's this endless cycle that we just won't get ourselves out of. And that's we're very intentional to say, there's got to be a better way for me to live. There's got to be a better way for me to live. Because this cycle just brings maybe joy for a moment, fulfillment for a moment, but it never seems to last. The hurrier we go, the behinder we get. The hurrier we go, the behinder we get. You see, then Jesus really pushes this whole thing over the finish line, the way he ends this section. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. He doesn't say you should not serve God and money. He says you cannot do it, right? These things are mutually exclusive from each other. You cannot do them both. For Jesus, it's not an option. We can't serve God and this system that our culture has put us in. We simply can't live the freedom way of Jesus and get sucked into the overconsumption that is normal in our society. You see, at the end of the day, we have to pick which master we're going to serve. Which master will you serve? I think it was last time that I spoke on a Sunday, I shared... Uh, I've been reading this book by John Mark Comer. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I don't know if you've ever read a book or listened to a podcast or even watched a show where it just grabs everything inside of you. It's like you just resonate 100% with this. And that's what this book has done for me. As I read through this book, it's like he wrote it right to kind of maybe my soul or my spirit, and I just find myself nodding and like this is exactly what our culture needs. It's getting rid of this idea of hurrying, trying to figure out what does God truly want for us? What does he want for us? So even some of the stats I've shared today are from this book. I would highly encourage you, uh, everyone, to read this book because it just talks about this countercultural lifestyle that we can live to help us make this daily decision to follow Jesus, right? Because that's what it is. It's not just, okay, yeah, I'm going to serve Jesus, and then we're good. But every day we're bombarded with this choice of which master am I going to serve? Jesus or money and the things that culture puts in front of me. 
Which one is it going to be? So as we get ready to wrap up in a few moments here, I just want to ask us a few more questions for us to consider, for us to ponder, for us to think about this morning, but also as we go this week. And here are a few questions for you. These are fill-ins on your notes as well. First one is, what if the formula that more stuff equals more happiness is simply bad math? Right? What if it truly is just bad math? More stuff equals more happiness. What if that is bad math? The second question for all of us to ponder is what if more stuff often just equals more stress? What if more stuff just equals more stress? More hours at the office, more debt, more years working in a job I really don't even enjoy, more time wasted cleaning and maintaining and fixing and playing with and organizing and reorganizing and updating all the junk that I don't even really need. Is it equaling more stress? And what if more stuff actually equals less of what matters most? What if more stuff just means less of the things that are truly important to us and that will make a genuine impact in our lives? Less time, less financial freedom, less generosity, which according to Jesus really is where joy is found. Less peace as we hurry through the mall parking lot. Less focus on what life is actually about. Less mental real estate for creativity. Less relationships, less margin, less prayer. Less of what we actually ache and long for. What if more stuff just equals less of all that we really need? You see, we're left with this choice. Are we going to reject culture's messaging and choose a better way to live that Jesus offers us? Or are we going to go home? Are we going to get back into our routine where days and weeks go by where we're just pursuing that next thing? Where we're saying, yeah, I'll get to this other stuff, but I've got a career. I've got this trip I want to take. I want these things because my neighbors have them and they look really happy. But I promise you, when Jesus says you can serve either God or money, it has to be one or the other. Because one of these paths truly does lead to joy and to contentment and to happiness and fulfillment and the ability to be generous while the other one just promises these things, but at the end of the day, always leaves us empty. And trying to figure out what do I need to do differently? What do I need to do next? And I got to tell you, as I was working on this message, even talking this morning, I'm talking to myself here just as much as I'm talking to you because this is a very real thing that I would say the vast majority of our culture struggles with. None of us would ever say, yeah, I'm serving money. I'm serving my stuff. But if we were to take a deep look inside each of us and say, are the choices that I'm making, the lifestyle habits that I've created, what are they serving? Because I guarantee you they're serving something or someone. So for all of us today, that question is, who will I serve? God or money? Will you close your eyes and pray with me this morning? There's nothing spiritual about us closing our eyes. This really helps us to focus um, in the moment. And before we kind of pray to wrap things up here, I want to give all of us just a moment to pray. And you can just pray right in your head and we believe that God can speak right to our hearts. And so maybe something has hit home with you this morning. Maybe there's some lifestyle choices, maybe there's some habits, maybe there's some decisions that you know you've been needing to make or that you're having a tough time making. And I want to give God a few, just a moment here to speak to all of us and for us to speak to God. So let's do that for the next 30 seconds. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. And Jesus, we thank you for your, your wisdom, 
God, your teachings. Um, God, we know that you have the best path forward for all of us. And I pray as we read and study your words, the things that you'd have for us, God, you'd help us to truly take them to heart. God, you'd help us to lean into those things. God, help us to reject the lies of our culture, reject the lies that are just bombarded with us every single day. But I pray that you'd help all of us to choose to serve you. Heavenly Father, those wouldn't be just words that we say, but God, they'd be words that are matched with our lifestyles. God, because we know that, God, you want us to serve you because you know that that's what's best for our lives. God, you want us to have joy and contentment and peace. Lord, help us to really see where that is truly found by serving you with all of our hearts. So God, it's our prayer even this week as we all go about our ways. You'd help us start each day by reminding ourselves of which master we are going to serve. And God, you'd help that to steer us, help us to guide us every step of the way. So God, give us wisdom to make these choices. God, also every day, give us the courage to live them out. God, I thank you that you are with us. You say we are never alone. So God, thanks for being with us as we choose each day who we will serve. So God, be with us all. Give us the wisdom and the courage that we all need. It's in your name we pray. Amen.